We're going to pick up where uh, two weeks ago we started on the message about faithfulness and dedication in the house of God. And we're going to pick up where we left off. And this, is, this will be part two of that message. Uh, there's some things I want to cover. Thank you. And we're going to go ahead and dismiss the children. Amen. You go back there with your teacher, Christiana. She's going to teach you the word. Amen. And let's. All right. So I want to go over a few. Uh, I want to recap a couple of things. Uh, let's go over a few quick points, and then we're going to continue on with the rest of the uh, message concerning faithfulness and dedication in the house of God. Amen. Uh, so the one thing we looked at, faithfulness, we understand that faithfulness is the quality of being faithful. Uh, in the Greek, that's, that's the Greek word uh, pistos, which is to say you're trustworthy or reliable. Or it also goes on to say one who is easily persuaded, who trusts in God's promises. So if faithfulness is someone who's trustworthy, reliable, easily persuaded, who trusts in God's promises. Now to that point, let's go and look into uh, Romans chapter 4. I'm going to jump all the way to Romans chapter 4 in verse 21. Amen. Chapter 4 verse 21. Okay, so Romans chapter 4 verse 21. It says here, this is talking about Abraham and being fully persuaded that what he had promised God, what God had promised, he was also able to perform. So you see here that Abraham was easily persuaded concerning what God had promised. So he trust in he trusted in God's promises. Now, when we look at faithful, when you look at that that definition, another definition or another word for faithfulness is steadfast and unwavering. Uh, to be faithful is to be true. Let's look at another scripture scripture here, or actually, let's do this. Look at verses. Uh, look at verse twenty in Romans four. It's talking, still talking about Abraham. It says here that he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. So that first part, he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief. So that that other definition where it says it's steadfast, he was unwavering. He didn't stagger at God's promises. He stayed he stayed faithful to what God had promised him because he was one who was easily persuaded. Amen. So now we're going to look at another thing here. There were four keys and uh, one of the key, the four keys that we went over last time was love honor, obedience, and sacrifice. Those were the four keys that we looked at concerning faithfulness and dedication. But I want to uh, bring out more with those particular keys that we spoke about last time. So with these four keys, these are things that should be operating in your life to exhibit some type of faithfulness or dedication because you have to have love, honor, obedience, and sacrifice. Those things have to be working. Amen. So uh, I want to follow up on one of those keys or, or all of them. Actually, we want to touch on them. So the first thing I want to look at is love. Let's let's jump to first Corinthians chapter 13. We're not too far from there in uh, Romans. So we're going to jump to first Corinthians 13. I'll get there myself. At some point. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 2. It says here, Paul is talking about love, and we're talking about love because that's one of the four keys. It says here, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. So without charity, which is to say without love, he is nothing, even though he's freely operating in all of these gifts, prophecy. And as he says here, though he understands all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and though he has faith to move the mountains, uh, faith so that he can remove the mountains, if he had, he says here, and have not charity, I am nothing. So without love, you see, there is nothing. He is nothing without love. We have to have love. We have to operate in love. Amen. And because when we operate in love, when you have love, it is the absence of pride. 
And we know pride allows the devil, it gives the devil a foothold when you're operating in pride. But you have to have love in order to prevent that from occurring. But let's look at, uh, second, we're still in Corinthians. Let's jump down to verse 4 because we're still talking about love in uh, 2 Corinthians 13. Down the verse, uh, verses 4 and 5. Verse 4 says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth itself, vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Verse 5, doth not behave itself unseem, unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. And I like what it says here in the Amplify uh, Classic Edition concerning verse 5, uh, because I think it really brings out uh, the, the definite or brings out more in that particular scripture. So, in verse 5 in the Amplified Classic Edition, it says, uh, this is talking about love or charity. Love, it is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. It is not rude, unmannerly, does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way, for it is not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account to the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. So you see right there, faith, I mean, excuse me, love is not conceited. It's not arrogant. It's not inflated with pride. So you see where there's love that, that casts out pride. Amen. So you have to have love. Love is one of those keys for faithfulness to, to operate freely in your life. So love is one of the keys. Now we're going to look at honor and obedience. There was one thing we looked at last time. We looked at the life of Saul. Uh, let's let's jump to uh, chapter or first Samuel. We're going to jump to first Samuel chapter 13, verse 13. And we're look. So we looked at love. We know what love is without love. It is you're nothing. You have to have love. So love is love is a key in your in your walk. Amen. We're going to go to first Samuel. Chapter 13. And we're going to look at verse 13. This is looking at the life of Saul concerning honor and obedience. So in verse 13, if you look at the verse before that, a couple of things happen here. Saul, I'm not Saul, but Samuel gave Saul a, a commandment from God. He told him to do a certain thing. Saul did not do that. He did not honor the word of God. He did not honor the man of God over his life that gave him that commandment from God. So look at, let's look at 13. And Samuel said to Saul, thou has done foolishly. Thou has not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God which he commanded thee, for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. All that uh, Saul had to do was wait seven days for Samuel to show up. The seventh day got there, he jumped, he jumped ahead of what he was supposed to do. Because he jumped ahead, he said he'd done foolishly. And the Lord, the Lord would have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. This one thing that he did cost him the kingdom. He did other things that cost him the kingdom as well. When you read later on in the book of Samuel, you see that he did other things. But this one thing cost him the kingdom. So you have to ask yourself, you have to look at it like what one thing is God asking you to do? But because you're not operating in honor and obedience to that word that is given to you, you miss out on the perfect will of God. And that's what happened to Saul here. There's, there's a, let's break down what happened. One, he wavered or he staggered. Faithfulness means is to be steadfast. You don't waver. You don't stagger. So he staggered at what was told to him. Uh, and also, he wasn't trustworthy. That was one of the things that's in faithfulness. That's one of the, the, the definitions there. You're trust, trustworthy or you're reliable. So he wasn't reliable and he certain, certainly wasn't trustworthy. And also, he wasn't obedient to the word given to him by the man of God. So that's, so one, he didn't honor the man of God and he wasn't obedient to what the man of God said, what God said through him, through the man of God. Amen. So he wasn't obedient and he didn't honor the man of God. So you have love. So the, the four keys was love, honor, obedience, and now sacrifice. We're going to look at sacrifice. 
We're going to take a look at two scriptures concerning sacrifice. We're going to jump to 1 Kings. And this is dealing with the prophet Elijah and then Elisha at this time. So it's going to be 1 Kings chap uh, chapter 19. Excuse me. I don't think I mentioned that. Uh, So we're going to go to second, uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19, and we're going to read verse 19 through 21. So verse 19, this is the prophet Elijah. And this is after he was on the run from uh, Jezebel. The, God gave him a, a word, said, I want you to go do this, and I want you to find Elisha. So this is picking up after God gave him that word to go find Elisha. There's so much that happened in that, that chapter. I would urge you to read it because there's so much there. Uh, but we're going to, for the purpose of this message, we're going to look at verse 19. So it says in verse 19, so he departed thence, this is talking about the prophet Elijah, and found Elisha, the son of uh, Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he with the twelfth, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he, we're talking about Elisha, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned, talking about Elisha, and he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered to him. He didn't wait one second for what for when Elijah threw his mantle upon him. He knew exactly what was happening. If you look at the, ver the end of verse 20, it says, go back again for what have I done to thee. If you read other translations, it says, go back and consider what I've done. He said, consider the, the, the weight of what I've just done to you. I put my mantle on you. Consider the weight of it. But Elisha, his heart was already there. So he went immediately. He sacrificed. He was already plowing in the field. So he was working. He was doing something. So how many people who say have a career? God called them to do something, but they won't depart from that career. They'll try to hold on to it because they feel that, that, that this is what God wants for them. But, you know, if they're obedient, they would sacrifice that career and follow God and receive all that God has for them and be within the perfect will of God. Amen. So now let's look at another scripture concerning sacrifice. We're going to go all the way to Luke chapter 5, verse 27. Luke chapter five, Luke chapter five, verse 27. And this is uh, pretty powerful, too, when you look at this, when you read all of this in Luke. Uh, but Luke chapter five, verse 27, this is talking about Jesus. It says, and after these things, he went forth and saw a publican talking about Matthew, the well, name Levi. But we know this is uh, the call of Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said unto him, follow me. And in verse 28, it says, and he left all and rose up and followed him. So you see there, he was a tax collector, and Jesus said two words, follow me. Immediately he left everything, followed Jesus. So how many of us receive a word from God, and we sit and we wait? When you wait, that's that's a stubbornness to what God has told you or commanded you to do. You when you get you see what he did here. He said, Jesus said, follow me. And the next verse, he said, and he left all. It doesn't say he did this or he did that. He left and went immediately. When you look at the prophet Elisha, when the mantle was put on him, he went back, got rid of all his oxen, boiled the flesh and ran after Elijah. He immediately went towards what what God called them to do. Amen. So. You have those four keys, love, honor, obedience, and sacrifice. And these are things that when they're operating in your life, you can find, if these are operating in someone's life, then you can find them to have, to be faithful and to be dedicated in the house of God. Amen. So now what we want to do, that's just a brief recap of what we went over uh, two weeks ago concerning faithfulness. 
Now, what I want to do now is get into the second part of that, which is dedication. I want to look at dedication in the house of God, because these two things are, are very key when you talk about our Christian walk and in the uh, house of God that we're called to be in. These two things are very key. So one of them, uh, so one of the things we want to do, let's, you're already in Luke. Let's go to Luke chapter two, flip back to Luke chapter two. And we're going to go all the way to verse 49. This is a this is a young Jesus who, after a festival, uh, his mother and, and Joseph uh, could not find him. So they were searching for him three days, three days. They were looking for him and they found him in the temple. And uh, let's see, verse 49. Oh, excuse me, I'm Luke chapter two, verse 49 I was in chapter one, excuse me. Okay, let's look at verse 48. I want to look at that too. So verse 48, let's start there. And, and when they saw him, this is talking about his mother and Joseph. When they, when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, son, why hast, thou, uh, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. They were looking for him for a number of days. And this is what Jesus said. He said unto them, how is it that ye sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business. He said, I must be about my father's business. He was dedicated to what his father had called him to do. He was dedicated. He was focused on his father's business. I must be about my father's business. And as Jesus was, we must be about our father's business. We must be about his business. Amen. So one of the things with faithfulness there was another definition there, and it's called true heartedness, which is to say you're sincere or you have a pure heart. So you have true heartedness here. Now, dedication, that is wholeheartedness. So you have true heartedness and you have you have a sincere heart and then you have a whole heart. So you have you have those two things operating in the walk of a Christian. So you have to it was, excuse me in the house of God. You have to have those things operating. You have to have a sincere heart and you have to have wholeheartedly run after God. We're going to look at this here with a couple of scriptures. And when you look at Jesus in that scripture, you see that Jesus was committed or he was dedicated to the purpose that God had for him. Another uh, definition with uh, concerning dedication is perseverance and diligence so you have wholeheartedness perseverance and diligence those are things that that those are other synonyms for when you look at dedication so let's go to Ezra chapter 7 we're going to go all the way all the way to the book of Ezra this is going to be Ezra chapter 7 uh, picking up in verse 10. There we go. Amen. So Ezra chapter 7 verse 10. It says here, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel's statutes and judgment. So you see here he prepared his heart. He, in my notes I have, he dedicated himself to the law to do it. He wholeheartedly sought the law. It says here, he prepared. That's a very deliberate thing. You, when you prepare for something, you're wholeheartedly doing that. If you prepare a meal, you're focused on preparing that meal. So the same thing here, he prepared what? He prepared his heart. He prepared his heart to what? To seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel's statutes and judgment. So you see here, he wholeheartedly accept the call on his life and move forward in God's law to do it, not only to just study it, but to do it and to also teach it. Amen. So have we, have you, have you obeyed the call that God has on your life wholeheartedly? What has God told you? And have you wholeheartedly obeyed that? Do you even know what God has called you to do? If you don't, you, you can find that in the word. But let's move on to another another individual here that we want to look at. And we want to look at Caleb because Caleb, I think, is 
is a great example for someone who is dedicated to God's promises. He, he shows a lot of these qualities that we looked at here. So we're going to jump to Joshua chapter 14. All the way to Joshua chapter 14. And this, is in, and this is when they're moving into the promised land. Now, Joshua and Caleb, they were of the spies who were sent to, this, to spy out the land. And when they came back from the land, Joshua and Caleb were the only two that, that were full of faith that said, yes, we can take it. The other men, they saw the giants because there were giants there. So they saw the giants and they, they caused the people's heart to melt and be in fear. They operated in fear. There wasn't faith how they operated. So we're going to look at Joshua chapter 14 and we're going to read verse 7. This is Caleb talking to Joshua. Caleb says here, 40 years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to a spy out the land. So he was 40 years old when Moses sent him out. Uh, now we're going to continue reading. And I brought him word again as it was in my in mine heart. Let's jump down to verse nine. He's still he's continuing to talk. He said, and Moses swear on that day, saying, surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever because thou has what wholly followed the Lord my God. You see there, he was, Caleb, he was 40 then. 45 years later, he didn't stagger at God's promises. He never wavered. He was fully dedicated. It says here in the scriptures, he wholly followed the Lord. It said, you, because thou has wholly followed the Lord my God. Because he wholeheartedly followed him. He was dedicated to the promises of God. He, was, he persevered. Can you imagine being around uh, a large group of people who have no faith? And, they're, they're, and you see it, you see the promises and you take hold of it, but you're around all these people who don't have faith. Can you imagine what he had to endure 45 years? People fall off after two years if stuff doesn't happen as they thought. They say, well, God, you promised me this, but it's been two years, so, and they waver, you know? So you look at what, what uh, Caleb did here. He did not waver for 45 years. And because he didn't waver, God gave him what he was uh, told that he would be blessed with concerning that, uh, that land that they sought out. And because God blessed him, at 85 years old, he took down four giants. There was this, they were the sons of Anak. So these were giant men. The, this was like the lineage of Goliath. These were giants. He took down, he and his army, they took down four of them, four giants. So put that in perspective. This man was 40. He's 85 years old. He took down four giants. So, but Caleb is one that had persevering faith. He persevered through all of this to receive the promises that God had for him. He didn't waver. He didn't back down. He was diligent. He was everything that we looked at in these scriptures so far. Amen. So that's Caleb. He wholeheartedly followed God. Now, we just looked at some examples of what uh, dedication is. We looked at some examples of what faithfulness is. Now, let's look at what dedication is not, because I think it's important. It's one hand, you need to know what, what uh, faithfulness and dedication is, but now you need to see what dedication is not, and that can shed some light on some things in maybe in, in my life and then maybe your life as well. But let's look, look here. The one thing I want to point out concerning dedication, one, the one thing that sticks out about dedication, when you, when you look up the Webster's uh, Dictionary, when you look up the definition, one thing that pops out at me, it says single-minded or single-mindedness. Now, the opposite of that when you have single-minded, the opposite of that is double-minded. So you have single-minded and double-minded. Let's look at what the word says concerning being double-minded. Let's jump all the way to James. We're talking about uh, the, the opposite of being dedicated. If you're not dedicated, these are some things that's pro If you look at someone's life and they're not dedicated, these are some things that's probably going to stand out a lot. Uh, so we're going to go to James chapter one, all the way to James. Let me get there with you guys. Amen. 
Let's see here. There we go. James chapter 1, and we're going to jump to verse 8. We're going to read verse 8, and then we're going to take another, we're going to take a look at some other things. James chapter, uh, excuse me, James chapter 1, verse 8. It says here, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So we know that if you're dedicated, you have a single mind. You're focused on one single thing. But if you're double-minded, you're unstable in all your ways. Everything you do, it's unstable. Now, in the Greek, when you look at that, it says this. A double-minded person, or, or actually, let me do this here. I want to look at another scripture. Let's look at James chapter 4. Let's jump to James chapter 4, and I want to look at verse 4. Now hold your place there on, on James chapter 4, verses 4. Uh, let's look at that. It says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. For whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now keep that in your mind. Say, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now let's look at uh, what I put here in my notes. This is, listen to what it says here in the Greek about what it means. When you look up double-minded in the Greek, listen to what it says. It says a double-minded person is a person that is split in half, that is vacilla uh, vacillating like a spiritual schizophrenic. So a double-minded person is operating in spiritual schizophrenia. Let's look at what schizophrenia is to really understand it. And this is in the natural definition, but I want you to look at it in the spiritual, in spiritual sense. Schizophrenia is a long-term mental disorder. We can say a long-term spiritual disorder of a type involving a breakdown in relationship, in relation, excuse me, between thought, emotion, and behavior leading to faulty perception, inappropriate actions and feelings, withdrawal from reality and personal relationships, and delusion. So, and also, one of the things it points out here, unmotivated, emotionless, and indifferent. Those are the three qualities. When somebody who's not dedicated, you can see these things operating in their lives. They're unmotivated, and they're emotionless. And then they're indifferent to the things concerning God. That's spiritual schizophrenia. That, that's pretty heavy when you think about it. A double-minded person is spiritually schizophrenic. Let, look at some, so we know that those, those are three qualities. Unmotivated, emotionless, and indifferent. Those are the things that shows up in someone who's dealing with schizophrenia. Now let's look at this. Look at some of the, uh, the opposite words or antonyms for dedication. One of the things it says here is apathy, which is lack of interest, laziness, that's that unmotivated, laziness, unwilling to work, and indifference. Those are the opposites there. So you see, why are these things important? When you speak about faithfulness and dedication, the main thing, the number one thing that, that makes them important is one word, and that's unity. If you have people who are uh, of one single mind, they're dedicated and they're faithful, then you can have unity. You can't have unity if nobody's faithful. If they don't have love, for one, you have to have love. If they don't honor, honor the, the house of God, if they're not obedient to the word of God, and then if they're not making sacrifices for, for God. What, you know, we sacrifice our time for so many other things, but when it comes to church, we try to plan things around it. We don't really sacrifice for the house of God. So another thing is it edifies the body. When you come into the house of God, when you see somebody and you see that every weekend and week out they're here, they're on time, you know, 
They're faithfully worshiping. That, that edifies the body of Christ. That builds you up because you see that person, regardless of the circumstances that they're in, you see that person continually worshiping. You see that they're, they're unwavering in what God promised them. God promised them something, they're unwavering. They're continue to worship every day. You see them here, you see them on time. You say, hey man, I, you, you expect to see them. And then when you don't see them, you're like, well, where is, where is so-and-so? You know, what happened to them? See what I mean? It, it, it edifies the body to see someone here and see your faithfulness and see your dedication to the house of God. Uh, third point is it brings you into the fullness of all that God has for both you and the church. Because as we read earlier with Ezra, God had a call on his life. And we read with Jesus. Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. So we must be about our father's business because as Jesus had a purpose, we have a purpose too. And we have a, pur a purpose in the house of God. So if God called you to do something, if God told you to do something, you should be obedient and do that because whatever gifting he's given you or whatever uh, command that he's given you, it edifies the body. It builds us up. You know, if you're a singer and you sing, it builds us up because that's worship. If you're a teacher, you teach because that builds us up. It brings us into the uh, fullness of all that God has for us. So that's another thing. It brings you into the fullness when you're operating in faithfulness and dedication in the house of God. The fourth thing is that it glorifies God because of your faithfulness and dedication. And now it becomes a testimony to God's goodness. When you're faithful, when you're dedicated, you can testify to God's goodness because you are doing that. I've been so faithful to God. You can say, I've been faithful to God and God has done this. But people can see it. You don't even have to say it. Your faithfulness and your dedication should show. You don't have to, sh you don't have to say that you've been faithful because people can see it. It's a very tangible thing. We just saw when we looked at the opposites of, um, of, dedic of dedication, we look at what, of it, what was it? Apathy lack of interest you don't have any interest in the house of god laziness unwilling to do work maybe you maybe you were called to sweep the floors you don't even want to do that you know maybe and then also indifference it's unimportant the house of god the word of god is unimportant to you now you're double-minded a double it said in there a double-minded person is split in half uh where is it said a double-minded person is divided in interest, namely between God and the world. So if you're not a single mind and you're not dedicated, you're double-minded. You're not dedicated. You're not, you're not dedicated in the things of God and you're, you're divided in your interest between God and the world. You can't be divided in your interest. You can't come to church and say, amen, hallelujah, at the promises of God and then leave the house of God and forget everything that was taught and then start accepting. We just prayed earlier about the doctrines and seducing spirits. You go out there and then you start accepting part of what the world says and you're trying to mix this with what the world says. And then you have these inaccurate examples. You start looking at movie stars and say, well, that movie star, you know, he, he said God is real. So maybe, you know, I can be a movie star too and still do this. Did God tell you to do that? That's what you need to focus on. So you can't look to outside, you can't look at, you know, examples like that and try to mix the world, uh, mix that with your faith because then you'll be double-minded. You'll be divided in your interests and because you're divided in your interests, things won't work out like you want it to, to work out and then people will say, well, it doesn't work. No, you didn't work. That's the thing that happens, amen? So I want to go to, we're going to uh, close here in a little bit, but I want to go to one final scripture here. Um uh, Let's see. Yes. Let's look at this scripture here, because as we said, the, the, the reason that these things are important, one, it cultivates unity. When we're faithful, when we're dedicated, it brings us in the unity. We pray for unity this morning. Unity is the key. We have to be unified. Think about this. When an army goes out to war, if you have part of the army going there, part of the army going here and part of the army army here, how are they going to win a war that way? Anybody who's a soldier knows that you can't win a war like that unless you have a unified front. You have to be unified. Because why do you have to be unified? Because Satan is unified against the body of Christ. We have to be committed. We have to be disciplined. And we, we constantly have to press into what God is. And we have to be obedient. 
But if we're not faith, if we don't exhibit any faithfulness and any dedication, then we're not unified against what Satan is trying to do. And because we're not faithful, if we're dealing with, um, say, spiritual schizophrenia, now you're dealing with an open door. Satan has an open door because if you're think about this, think of the church as a fortress. If we're a fortress and we're all united against Satan, if one if just one of us is just is double minded. Now we're trying to, we're divided between the world and God, and that doesn't produce any fruit. So now if we're divided, that allows an end for Satan. That's all that Satan needs. He just needs to get a little foothold in your mind, and from there, he can ruin things for you. And it affects, it not only affects you, but it affects the house of God, because people see your faithfulness, as we see here in the points that I pointed out, it edifies, it cultivates unity it edifies the body it brings you into the fullness of all that God has for you and the church and it glorifies God it glorifies God we just talked about uh offering when he said he loves a cheerful giver well it glorifies God to see that you're faithful look at how he honored Caleb uh 45 years after he received the promise of Moses prophesied to him and said you're going to get that land that you saw because you wholly followed the Lord your God so imagine all that we can receive if we wholly follow the Lord our God and wholly dedicate ourselves to receiving the word coming into the house of God worshiping with all of our heart our mind and our soul imagine what we can receive from God amen but I want to jump to Hebrews we're going to close here and I want to jump to Hebrews chapter 12 picking up in verse 1 uh, let me get there myself Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Chapter 12. Oh, let me go back here. Okay. Chapter 12, verse 1. It says here, Wherefore, seeing we are also we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which doth easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that has been set before us. Looking unto Jesus, that's our example. Jesus is your example, not movie stars, not rock stars. Jesus is your example. You know, your pastors are your example. The people that are over that that God has put over your life, those are your examples, not the world. Looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith for who the joy that was set before him. It says the joy that was set before him. See that the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand throne of God. Amen. So let us, as it says here, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which thus so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So we have to run that way, that race. We have, to, like it says, we must be about our Father's business. So we must be dedicated. We must exhibit faithfulness in the house of God. For if we do, it just blesses, it glorifies God, and it blesses the house of God, and it brings us further into unity. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand up. I want to thank everybody for coming out today. And, you know, the thing about this message, you know, when you're preparing it, you really, it really shows us. You, you, it shows us we need to look, examine ourselves. The word says you need to examine yourself and see if there's areas where maybe you need to fine tune a couple of things. I know, I know I have, I know I, I did need to fine tune some areas. So it brought some things out in my life, but let's, let's go to God and let's, let's pray. And then we'll close father. We thank you for this day.